Easter.
Good morning. Happy Easter. Yeah, aren't they great? Yeah. We have so much fun on Sunday afternoons singing, singing praise to God. Um, so, announcements this morning. You see the yellow slips on the tables. If you are visiting with us today, we would love for you to fill these out and place them either in the <coughs> baskets up front or the, basket, the baskets on the tables. Also, if you have a prayer concern, there's a space for that for any of you. If you have a prayer concern, you want to write that down, and we'll share that with our prayer group that meets on Thursdays. Um, you can place that in the basket as well. Today... The children are going to stay with us during worship, so they're not going to follow Miss Jillian back to Children's Church. They're going to stay in here and have church all together with us this morning. Um, there are no afternoon activities today. We're going to let you, uh, all of you go home and enjoy Easter with your families, so no youth ensemble, no bells, no youth group this afternoon. And um, also on Tuesday at 1 p.m., there is a symposium on celebration of life services. So those of you who might be interested in that, that, that will be taking place Tuesday at 1 p.m. So with that said, let's all stand and let's worship the risen Christ together.
your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Wonderful to see you all. My goodness, what an overwhelming day already. I hope your day has been as beautiful, as wonderful, as awe-inspiring as mine has been. I just want to share with you, and I mean this wholeheartedly, Easter Sunday morning is my favorite morning of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Even before I knew of resurrection, even before I knew of anything about Christianity, I don't know if it's part of the culture that we live in, part of the environment that we breathe. I know sometimes we get it right with how we understand resurrection. Sometimes we don't get it right. But nevertheless, there's something that transcends our understanding, our comprehension. And in a sense, it's magic because it transcends all of our categories. But there is something in the air. There's something about the life that is given to us. The life that is eternal. The life that is whole. The life that is eternal. The life that will never end. The life that is ours now. The life that is ours forever. I can tell you too, the first time I ever remember praying was as a child and I happened to be on an Easter egg hunt. And everyone had been looking for the prize egg and all the children had given up. And I remember saying, Lord, please show me where that prize egg is. I'm serious about this. It's the first time I remember praying. And take this for what you will. But my mind and my eyes looked, and over by a fence, it was one of those metal fences, and there was a post and next to it a little bit of where they had dug, and there was a hole and some grass had grown over. And I walked over there, stuck my hand in there, and guess what I found? The prize egg. Now, in a way, that's a story that's fun to remember, but in another way, I would like to share this with you. I believe God knows our hearts better than we know our own hearts. God knows what we desire. God knows where we are on our spiritual journey. God knows where you are this morning. God knows why you're here, and we're here for a number of different reasons. God knows where you are in the season of your life. If we truly desire to encounter God, God is eager to self-disclose God's self. God does not want to be aloof. God is the transcendent one, make no mistake. But God is also the eminent one, the one who is very near and present to us. Some of us say, well, you know, I can't honestly say that I desire to encounter God. I can't really say that in all honesty. I don't know that I truly desire to encounter God. Howard Thurman, write his name down, look him up. He is considered by some a prophet mystic. He was, they call, he's also considered a seminal figure. He was a seed-bearing figure. A lot of people benefited from his insights. He was the dean of the chapel at 
Boston University, and I could say more about him, look him up. It's worth looking him up. But he had profound, profound insights into things. And he says, if you don't have the desire, hear this, if you don't have the desire, ask for the desire for the desire. Isn't that brilliant? Ask for the desire for the desire. This morning, I pray that we will all have the desire to encounter Jesus anew, the one who really is the Son, the one who truly reveals who we are as sons and daughters, the one who reveals who God is, the one whose life, his teachings, his actions, his sacrificial love, his encounter with those who were marginalized and oppressed and those who were considered other, his challenge to those who would exclude and wouldn't welcome others, his willingness to do whatever is necessary to demonstrate God's love for us, to demonstrate God's love for us. I pray that it is our desire to encounter him anew. So with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we, are, we know that we are not here by accident or coincidence. We are exactly where we are supposed to be. We thank you for the power of resurrection. We thank you for the power of your love. We thank you for the power of your life-giving word. The word that became incarnate. The one who lived and walked among us. The one who demonstrated your absolutely unconditional love. The one for whom after the world had thrown its best and worst at him said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The one whose love was so powerful that he transcended even death. The one whose resurrection assures us of our own. This morning we know that you know everything we're going through. You know our hearts, our minds, our hopes, our anxieties, our fears, our worries. You know our losses and our griefs. We ask you to make it possible for us to pause for reality. Not from reality, but for reality. The reality of your eternal peace, the reality of your eternal joy, the reality of your eternal wholeness, the reality of your eternal life where nothing is missing, nothing is broken, where we are one, one with you, one with one another, where we experience the joy that we were created to experience, the joy that comes from loving you with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, from loving our neighbors, from loving ourselves, and in this world, loving even our real or perceived enemies. We are here to celebrate you. We're here to celebrate your son. We're here to celebrate his freedom and his response. We're here to celebrate your power to achieve your purposes, to reconcile all things, all people, all of creation. We're here to celebrate the hope of the resurrection the hope that is rooted in our faith our confidence that we will never ever ever be separated from your love we thank you in Jesus name even as we pray the prayer that he taught us when he said our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite Debbie to come forward, and she's going to share a few words about the special offering that is in your bulletins. Good morning and happy Easter. Every day, disciples offer answer the call to be a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. No matter what challenges we face, from combating racism to ending human trafficking, from starting a church to sustaining a community, disciples know that by sharing the work, we can accomplish what by God's design, we cannot do alone. Our Easter offering supports our Disciples Missions Fund, supporting over 13 missions, including the Disciples Home Missions, Disciples Men and Women, Council on Christian Unity, and Global Ministries. The Bible verse for this Easter offering is from John 5, 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. As disciples, we all benefit from the fruits of our general ministries. These fruits are made possible through the connections and support that grow in collaboration with our regions and our congregations. On this Easter Sunday, let us give our own fruits to the mission of the whole, to love G others as Jesus has loved us. Thank you. I'd like to invite those who are serving communion up front to come forward. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we want you to know that you are welcome here. Who is welcome here, church? Who is welcome here? Everyone. And when we say everyone, we truly mean everyone. Regardless of your background, regardless of your religious affiliation, regardless of your race or nationality, regardless of the particulars of your birth, who you love, everyone is welcome here. Who is welcome here? Everyone is welcome here, and we mean that. And we mean that everyone is welcome to celebrate communion as well. Because we realize that it's not the invitation of a pastor, preacher, teacher. It's not the invitation of a denomination. It's not the invitation of a local church. It's the invitation of Jesus. And Jesus welcomes everyone to celebrate communion. We have some offerings at several stations. We have an offering to your right. There's a table there. There's a table to your left. We have communion at those tables. We have opportunities for an offering. Now, that is just for logistical simplicity. We did not place an offering basket next to communion to in any way hint that you're paying for communion. You are not. <laughs> communion is the gift of God. An offering is the gift of God as well. That we can give is a gift from God. God is love, simply and profoundly. And loving is giving. And so when we give, we really are participating in the very being of God. That is our joy. And then we also have a prayer station to the back, and you'll notice that there are some candles, and in the center is what we consider a Christ candle. And we always remember that Christ, the light of the world, shines in the darkness, and the darkness will never, ever, ever overcome the light. Some of us are going through a season of life where we want to be reminded of that assurance, that ultimate reality of God's eternal love. You can light a candle. There will be some people who will be there praying for you, and I can assure you, if I was going through a season of darkness in my life, those would be the people I would re reach out to. You're invited to respond to these offerings as you feel so led. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father God, who are we that you should love us so much? Over this period of Lent, as we have walked with you towards the cross, passing through that night of the Last Supper, where the disciples looked at one another in confusion and, and worry, transitioning to the day of horror and suffering, where you, Jesus, allowed men, just men, to drive nails into your hands and into your feet. In that perfect compliance with the will of God, even unto the point of death, your word says, but 
Today is Easter. The day where we see that sin and death are swallowed up in the resurrection victory. For you have risen. And you have triumphed over sin and death. And we, being a part of your body, share in that victory. For today, we are the children of Easter. And as we come to this table, we think on these things. Amen. And so on that night, so long ago, in an upper room, Jesus took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and gave thanks and said, this is my body given for you. And then he took a cup and he said, this is my body. This is my blood. The covenant, the new covenant. Take and drink. And do this in remembrance of me. The gift of the Lord God.
I once heard someone describe another person's prayer being so powerful, the person said, when that person prays, he just takes you there. Each week when we hear them, they have that power to take us there, don't they? It's some, they're just extraordinary. The soulfulness of their voices, the soulfulness of what they do. They just usher us right into the presence of God, and then you're stuck with me always to follow that right up. We're going to look at our scripture readings to begin with, I want us to think about the power of resurrection. This is a familiar verse to many of us, or passage to many of us. And we pray that it will become more familiar still. And my prayer is that we will internalize the deep truths of this scripture reading that God wants us to internalize. That God will open our eyes to some insights perhaps that we've never seen before that we will open ourselves to the possibility that we can be transformed, that the people we were when we walked into this place will not be the people we are when we leave, that we are growing into our true identity, who we are as children of God. And I believe that if we will pay close attention to this reading, we will discover who we truly are. Now, my print is a little bit smaller than yours. So if I fumble over this a little bit, thank you for your grace. And before we get started, there's a reason I'm going to ask this one more time, and I hope you don't get tired of it, but I'm going to ask this question one more time. Who is welcome here? That means children are welcome here. Children make noises sometimes. They, they laugh. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes they talk. And children are welcome here. 
Some of you who are gathered here think of worship as reverence and solemnity. Some of you are expressive and shout out, Amen! Who's welcome here? All right, so with that in mind, let's read this scripture reading together. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go tell my brothers, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. The power of resurrection. The power of resurrection. I have been for a long time intrigued by power and what it truly means. The power that is available to us as children of God. What power do we have? In a sense, what is our potential? What can we realistically hope for in this world? What can we realistically hope for within our personal lives? What can we actually obtain? And it seems to me if we can answer that question, then we know how to set our goals. Now we know what to pursue in life. Now we know what we are here to do, what we are here to accomplish. But I often wonder about our human condition. For those of you who have been here for several weeks, we know we talk about our human nature, and we talk about our human condition. Our human nature, as I deeply believe it to be, is that each and every one of us is a child of God. Not everyone agrees with that, but that's my deeply held faith conviction. Each and every one of us is a child of God. That is our true nature. But we also have a human condition. There is a gone wrongness. I love that one theologian described it there that way. There is a gone wrongness within each and every one of us. There is a gone wrongness within us collectively. We can say with the words of Paul, that which I would do, I do not do. Those things I wish I did not do, those are the things that I keep on doing. How many of you can attest to that experience? So we know there is a human condition. But if we are children of God, and Jesus reveals that we are children of God, what power do we have to become the people that we were created to be? And to the degree that we have that power, it seems to me that we would want to be response-able as well. Again, it bears repeating, there are theologians who are much more profound than I am, and I quote them not to sound pedantic or academic or well-read, but because I can't take credit for it on my own. Randy Maddox was someone who studied John Wesley's theology for quite some time, and he pinpointed what he believed to be John Wesley's 
orienting the concern. He described it as an orienting concern, that which all of his other theological concerns revolved around. And he came to identify in John Wesley what he described as responsible grace. Responsible grace. Without God, he said, we cannot be saved. Yet without our God-empowered but uncoerced response, we will not be saved. Did everyone catch that? No, some of you didn't. Without God, we cannot be saved. Yet without God's empowered but uncoerced response, we will not be saved. Without our God-empowered but uncoerced response, we will not be saved. Did that make sense now? So we can take that a step further because we talk about salvation and sometimes some of us think about salvation primarily in terms of what happens in the hereafter. But we can also understand it in this way. Without God, we cannot fulfill God's will. Yet without our God-empowered but uncoerced response, we will not fulfill God's will. Is everyone with me? We can bring it back to the here now. And I believe that there is a power that is available to us, a power that is revealed in the resurrection that empowers us, gives us the potential to grow in our identity and to fulfill God's will in the here and now. So let's talk about that for a little while this morning. When we talk about power, what are we talking about? Power is the ability to achieve purpose. Sometimes people think of God as all-powerful. If we were to get nuanced a little bit on a Sunday morning, an Easter Sunday morning, others have identified God's power as an unmatched power. Not omnipotent, as in can do anything, because God would never do anything that's contrary to God's own true nature. So God will never do anything that is contrary to love. God has the power to self-limit God's power, which is a power in itself. God has the power to constrain God's power. And there is a power that is available to us as well. It's often described as a dynamis is the Greek word which, from which we would get dynamite. There's a power, there's a force. There's another word that is similar to that, but it's more of a strength that we can get. And I had an insight into that. There was a time early on in my vocation as I was discerning my vocation and I was working for a children's center where the children had been neglected and abused and had been through all kinds of things, and now they were acting out, and understandably so. And these children would call you anything but a child of God. They would throw things at you. They would go off, it was, as it was often described. And I can remember sitting outside. I often worked 12-hour shifts on the weekends. And I would sit outside, and I would be prayer, praying, and I would have a prayer book. And I was praying for the power. Well, the truth is the power was given me by God to be there in the first place. And that's that dynamis that we're talking about, that force. But then I realized I also needed strength throughout the day. And that's the kind of power that God will give us, the power that is revealed in the resurrection, the power of God's love. And make no mistake, the resurrection is the truth of the eternal reality. And the truth of the eternal reality is simply and profoundly God's love. That is the ultimate reality. Now that's a power in itself to gain that insight. When we talk about real, and for those of you who are here for the first time and perhaps are not familiar with this language when I was praying that we would take a break for reality, not from reality. Reality, the ultimate reality, is God's will as it is. The ultimate reality is God as God is. And when we say God is love, we're not just talking about a touchy-feely kind of love. God's love includes our emotions but transcends our emotions. We're talking about the ultimate reality where all things are fulfilled. As again, as one theologian described it, love is that meta value. It is that value without which we have access to no other value. But once we have that value, once we have that reality, we have access to every other reality. Without love, there is no peace. Without love, there is no joy. Without love, there is no justice. Without love, there is no equality. Without love, there is no wholeness. 
Once we have love, the ultimate reality to the degree we have love is the degree we have peace. The degree we have love is the degree we have joy. The degree we have love is the degree we have wholeness. Are you with me? Love is the ultimate reality. Now, we see love in the cross. How? You've heard me say on a number of occasions, and I do repeat it because some of us have heard what I believe, I believe is an errant understanding of the cross and how it saves us so much it re requires a great deal of repeating. There was one of the songs that Beth and I changed the words to that you were singing earlier this morning. This is Amazing Grace. He came and took my place. We changed those words so I can take my place. Some people understand that God was punishing Jesus because we deserve that punishment. For me, it's always hard for me to reconcile in my mind how God is all-loving, yet he had to punish someone in order for us to be forgiven. Particularly when Jesus would often say, go, your, sons are, your sins are forgiven you, and no sacrifice or punishment had taken place. Are you with me so far? God does not cause all things, but God can cause all things to work for good. When we look at the cross, I don't believe God caused it. I believe it was inevitable but unnecessary. It was inevitable because of human sin. God didn't need it. God has never changed God's mind about us. God will never change God's mind about us. The power of the cross is it reveals God's eternal love. So when Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done, it's not God's will that there be a punishment. It's God's will that love will be perfected, that love will go all the way to the end, will suffer everything that Jesus suffered. The abandonment of those who were closest to him, the violence, the mocking, the betrayal, the ridicule, the suffering, the agony. And after all of that, say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In that moment, the power of love is revealed. That's power. God's purpose is to restore that which was lost. And what was lost was relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with one another. We were created for one another. We were created for relationship with God. Sin, where we miss the mark, is we turned inward rather than an other orientation, rather than our orientation toward God and one another. And then from there, relationships have been fractured ever since. So if that is what is lost, Jesus was willing to do whatever is necessary to restore that which is lost. And one of the ways that we do that is through the power of, of love on the cross and the power of resurrection which says this is the ultimate reality everything else is temporary violence hate greed exclusion is temporary love crushed will rise again it's in its nature to do so there is a power that jesus possessed he said no one takes my life from me I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. There's a power that Jesus possessed that you and I have. The power of resurrection. Let's look at resurrection and we'll see how far we get to this. You know I rehearsed this outline over and over and over and I never ever get through it. Because that was point one of like seven. Resurrection. Resurrection, what do we mean by resurrection? That resurrection is a mystery that we will never fully understand. But that doesn't mean we can't know something about it, right? And we're growing in our understanding of resurrection. Now, I love words, and I'm going to spare you the Greek words because your eyes will glass over, and I'll forget these Greek words in about three weeks. But it's interesting because we can get a new insight as to what their original meaning was. And one of those meanings was to recover from a debilitating condition resurrection to recover from a debilitating condition now that fits really well when you think about how we've been talking about our human nature and our human condition think about that the power of resurrection is for us to recover from whatever about our condition is debilitated and think about the word able we are now able to be the people we were created to be the resurrection reveals that. The resurrection reveals that because it is the one who was resurrected who reveals who we are. But it is the power to recover from a debilitating condition. The other is an extreme state of alert wakefulness. I like that too. 
an extreme state of alert wakefulness. Now, why would that be? Because many of us are more or less asleep. That's part of our human condition. We're not conscious. We're not aware. We don't have a God consciousness. By that, I'm saying an awareness. A profound sense with clarity of who God is. A profound sense with clarity. A clear consciousness of who we are. Of who our brothers and sisters are. Of who our real or perceived enemies are. We don't see this clearly. We don't see the state of affairs in the world clearly. We don't have a consciousness. Part of resurrection, the power of resurrection, the power of love to give us life and wholeness and peace and consciousness is to be in an extreme state of alert wakefulness so that we can see ourselves, others, enemies, and the state of affairs in our world as God sees them as we are called to see them. So that's a power of resurrection. Now here are some things I want to leave us with that we can take home with us this morning. The power of resurrection is the power of hope. I'm going to read to you for those of you who printed it or for those of you who downloaded it onto your phones or your tablets and for those of you who didn't, go home and do that. Just kidding. There are some supplemental readings. If you'd like to, I think they're worthwhile. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which you have been called. That you may know the hope to which you have been called. The resurrection gives us hope. Hope. Hope is so very different from wishful thinking. Hope is rooted in the ultimate reality. Our hope is rooted in our faith, and our faith is rooted in the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is God's love. The ultimate reality is that all things will be restored. The ultimate reality is that whatever has been lost will be restored. Whatever has been broken will be healed. That is the ultimate reality. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Our confidence today is the assurance, faith, confidence, confide, with faith. That's what confidence is. Because we know we have faith in the ultimate reality, our hope is not wishing. Whatever we are going through, we know it's temporary. Sickness is temporary. Exclusion is temporary. Hate is temporary. Unnecessary suffering is temporary. It is not a matter of if we will get through this. It is a matter of when we will get through this, and we will get through this. Whatever we are going through, whatever season of life, we are always with hope. That's the reason Peter said to those that we are not to grieve like those who have no hope. What does that mean? We love intensely. When someone dies, we grieve intensely, but we don't grieve as people who do not have hope. We know we will be restored. We grieve. It hurts. Perhaps even more so for people who know love. But we are people with hope, and we know that this grief is temporary, that we will one day be restored. Now, I'm going to hasten on. Boy, I'm going to hasten on. I've said briefly, and it's important for us to know, the power for us to see ourselves as God sees us. Who is Mary Magdalene? Historically, what comes to mind about Mary? Come on, you can say it. Prostitute. Where is that Bible passage, by the way? It's not there. How many of you had heard that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? Hold them high. The resurrection is the power to see ourselves as God sees us. Let's say she was. Is that who she is? Is that her identity? Whatever anyone says about you is not who you are. Whatever you say about yourself, other than being a child of God, is not who you truly are. The power of the resurrection is to see ourselves as God sees us, to see others as God sees them, to see our enemies as God sees them. How did Jesus treat his enemies? 
with love. Jesus loves absolutely unconditionally. God's love is a value-creating love. It is not a value-seeking love. God does not love us because we are worthy. We are worthy because God loves us. Whatever we think our reputation is apart from a child of God, we've got to take that condition, what we've been thinking over time, our thoughts become our words, become our actions, become our habits, become our character, become our destiny. We could have replaced character with condition. What we've been thinking about ourselves over time now has become a part of our condition. If that condition is contrary to our true nature, we trust God, not our thoughts. That's the power of the resurrection, the power of God's love. The power of the one that said, Father, forgive them. It's the same one who was raised. We know his words are true. That's the power to see ourselves as we see ourselves. Now, when we see other people now, we know we we have a condition and we are children. We're not adults. We're children. We're growing. We see other people who are acting in ways, but we know that's not their true nature. That's part of how we can love other people. And Lord knows, we don't want people judging us on our present condition, do we? We want people judging on us on our true nature, which is children of God. I've said enough about that, about our true nature, but I do want to see this. There's a progression, there's a progression in John that I want you to see. In John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word became flesh. And he gave the power to become children of God, anyone who believed in Jesus, to become children of God. Now, what does that mean to me? We are children of God. When we believe in Jesus, we have the power to become who we truly are. Jesus reveals who we are. Jesus, the Son of God, reveals who the sons and daughters are of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have that power. Now, it's interesting. As they progress... In John chapter 15, now this has shown up, this new commandment has shown up, but it's interesting, just stay with me for a second, the progression. Children, this is my commandment that you love one another, John 15 beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What did he command? Love one another as I have loved you. How does Jesus love us? Unconditionally, sacrificially. You are my friends. You're becoming just like me. If you obey my commands, love one another as I have loved you. Now you're becoming who you were always created to be. You're a child. You're growing. You're friends. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Now let's look at John chapter 20, and this one's in your bulletin. Mary's holding on to him. He says, do not hold on to me, verse 17, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. My God. My Father, your Father. Go tell my brothers, Adelphos. That's brothers and sisters. Be like saying all men are created equal. We don't mean all men are created equal, do we? We mean all men and women. That word Adelphos doesn't mean the same mother. We are of the same family. Children, servants, friends, brothers and sisters of Jesus. As we grow in love, the power of love, the power of resurrection, we are growing in our true nature. We are becoming the people we were created to be. Now I'm going to say this finally. The power to never walk alone. The power to know that you never walk alone. That's the power of resurrection. Beyond how we feel. This morning, as is my practice on an Easter Sunday morning, and I am so grateful that I have this opportunity. I drove down to the river and walked out by the river front. Whoo, Lord, here it comes. Seriously. And I got out of the car, and he never fails, ever. He has never disappointed me, ever. Jesus will never disappoint you. I'm no holier, and you know this, those of you, I'm no holier than anyone. I have the issues in my life that I struggle with just like you do. 
I have my days when I'm not filled with the joy. I have the days where I willfully do stuff I know I'm not supposed to do. And I was walking to the river. It was gorgeous, by the way, the moon, the way it was shining on the river and the sun. I mean, it was just remarkable. And I fell into an ugly cry. My face was crumpled, and I was talking right out loud, and I realized I started looking around because I was embarrassed <laughs> if anybody had seen me. And I was laughing, and I could realize I didn't have to be embarrassed in front of Jesus. I didn't have to be embarrassed. And I was saying to myself, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. And then, through the inside of Steve, and the way that came together, I realized God was saying, yes, you do. It's not about what you earned. It's not about what you've done. It's not about what you leave undone. I will always be with you. I will always love you. And in these moments on an Easter Sunday morning, when you see a sunrise and you see the moon and you see that light and you see all of this life around you and you feel close to me and you know that I'm with you, when you are walking through hell, I will never leave you. My prayer for us this morning is that we will know the power of resurrection, the power of who we are and who we were created to be, the power to see ourselves, our loved ones, even our enemies as God sees us, the power to know we will never, ever, ever walk alone. Nothing will separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. If there's anyone here this morning who's never made a confession of faith, it can begin with an inkling. I can assure you, he really is the one. You don't have to be afraid of him. If there's anyone who's not a member of a community of faith, we can't do this on our own. It doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to be institutional. It doesn't have to be denominational. But we're called to be in community. And we would welcome you here. Church, who is welcome here? If you're looking for a faith community, we welcome you. And we're going to learn what it means to welcome. And we're going to learn to love one another as God loves us. We're going to learn to obey that command. All of us have an opportunity to renew our dedication to understanding, to growing, to knowing the power of resurrection. I invite you to respond as God is calling you to respond. With the hands that formed the world, you washed our feet. Kneeling down, you laid aside your majesty, and you said for us to go and do the same. So we serve the glory of our King. You left heaven's throne to rescue us. Then you rolled away the stone, the victory won. 
Rivers, hearts that long to see your justice done. And let the river of your mercy flow through us. And let compassion be the loudest song we sing. Till the day when every tongue declares you. is all understanding, all comprehension, the love that is the greatest power in the universe, the love that is the power of the resurrection, the love from which we will never, ever be separated. May that love guard and sustain our hearts this Resurrection Sunday and forevermore. Amen.